15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello once again, and thank you, as always, for joining us on the Space Nuts podcast. My name's Andrew Dunkley, your host, and with me is Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. Hello, Fred. Hi, Andrew. How are you doing in Dusty Dubbo? Very, very dusty, very, very windy, very, very dry, very, very nasty. Um, I got in the car the other day after one particular dust storm and I went to clean the windscreen and I, I usually hit the washers first and then the wipers. And I did it the wrong way around, and you should have. It just went, <laughs> and then I hit it with the water, and this big mudslide went down my windscreen. It was terrible. Uh, yeah, oh, it's just horrible, Fred. I don't know. I don't know when we'll ever see an end to this. Um, we've been in a drought for probably two years now, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. We've got animals coming into town looking for food and water that you just don't see. I saw an echidna the other day. Mm-hmm. We've got kangaroos living on the streets. Mm-hmm. In some uh, parts of town, we, we, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if soon we start seeing emus and maybe some camels because they're, they're running out of things to eat and drink. So mm-hmm. they tend to move to wherever the green grass is. And look, there isn't much of that here, but mm-hmm. uh, it's just a real mess here at the moment and uh, everyone's struggling. It's, it's really um, um, depleting the economic movement of the town. How is um, um, the Western Plains Zoo? coping uh they, they well the the other thing that's um sort of hurting us is is tourism we're just not getting people coming yes. out here yeah. and so the zoos numbers are down tourism numbers are down significantly this this summer and it, it just all adds up to one big um pile of um doo-doo it's it's not it's not a nice place to be at the moment and i would never say that about where i live i've been here 25 years and i love it but right now it's just like something out of um, a, an apocalyptic movie. It, uh, you look at the sky and just about every other day it's orange. If it's not orange, it's it's sort of blue with smoke from the fires. Uh, I, you know, we, we have probably one clear day a week and that's become normal this summer. And yeah. Ad, yeah. adding to that, uh, the number of temperatures over 40 degrees Celsius, uh, we've had more this summer than I can ever remember. And we had like four or five, maybe six in a row there uh, a few weeks ago uh, with numbers up around 46, 47 degrees. It's just horrific. Um, the, the good news is the climatic models are starting to work back in our favour. One of the big um, things that affects the weather here is the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is the surface yep. temperature of the Indian Ocean. And for a, for a while there, it was like four degrees above average, which is, you know, means dry weather. And that has just in the last couple of weeks plummeted back to normal, which means we may start to see normal weather conditions return. And, and that's been evidenced a bit with some uh, specks of rain here and there. But we're, you know, it's so dry, uh, you get one frontal system through and you just get this big wall of dust that hits you like a, I don't know, just a brick wall. It's, mm-hmm. um, it's, it's just impossible to try and describe it to people. And then you show them the photos and they go, oh, my gosh, yeah. <laughs> how did you get through that? You just got to. You just got yeah. to. But it's getting into the air conditioning. It's getting into houses. It's getting into car uh, systems. It gets into your eyes, your throat, your nose. Uh, it gets all through your hair. It's um, it's just <laughs> I don't, honestly, I don't remember any other year like this. I've seen dust storms before. I've seen locust plagues. I've seen you know I've seen it all out here. This is the true country. But um, this year they've kind of thrown it all together. Even the locusts are complaining. So <laughs> it's pretty hideous. Yeah. Well. Mm. We all know why it's happening. <laughs> yes, we do. Yes, we do. And yet there are still those who deny it. Um, yes, there are. But yeah. I think the evidence is far beyond reasonable now. Yeah. Let's get on to some more... Um, yes, on that happy note. <laughs> more th- let's get into stuff that's not of this world, let's say. Uh, and, and, and the focus today is on Australia because we've got uh, three stories about um, uh, Australian astronomical situations or events or um, even awards. Uh, now, if, um, and, and one of them is about a, uh, a planet that's been discovered. Another is the oldest impact impact crater uh, uh, ever 
found, and that is in Australia. And uh, one of our Aussie astronomers is to get a major US award for the first time in about five million years, I think. Uh, <laughs> so we'll look at all of that. But we'll start off, Fred, with TOI257b. And this is a weird planet because if there was an ocean big enough, it would float. Exactly. Just like our own planet Saturn, uh, which would also float. I, uh, I didn't know that. Ah, didn't you know that? Oh, well, there you go. Uh, Saturn's density is less than that of water, uh, and it uh, it has that in common with TOI 257b, (laughs) uh, which is being called Queensland's planet. So that's why this is an Australian story. It is uh, a planet that was first detected by the TESS uh, spacecraft. Uh, I can't remember what test stands for it's a terrestrial uh something as ter- transit i beg your pardon transiting exoplanet survey satellite get it right fred the transiting exoplanet survey satellite is tess and that um that spacecraft does what the Kepler spacecraft used to do. It looks for dips in the brightness of stars that betray the presence of an orbiting planet so t o i and i think that's something like um uh uh, target of interest. I think that's what it means. It's a test term. TOI 257b uh, basically was revealed by the TESS spacecraft, but followed up by telescopes uh, in regional Queensland, not very far from the city of Toowoomba, which is a beautiful place oh, it is. on the highlands there, mm. uh, on the Darling Downs. And um, not very far out of Toowoomba is uh, is a mountain called, well, it's a hill really, but it's called Mount Kent. Uh, Mount Kent for a long, long time has had an observatory operated by the University of Southern Queensland. I've had a little bit to do with that observatory from time to time because I am very, um, uh, very happy to have have a, a close connection with the University of Southern Queensland. They've got an adjunct appointment there, which I'm very proud of. Yes. Uh, so Mount Kent is uh, it's on a good site uh, and has now state-of-the-art uh, equipment, uh, f- uh, an array of five 70 centimeter. What's that? Uh, that's kind of 38 feet or about something like that. Um, robotic telescopes. Um, they're, they're big telescopes, um, you know, by the, these sorts of standards. And they're part of a project called Minerva Australis. So this is the Southern Hemisphere version of Minerva. Minerva 2 is an acronym, but I can't remember what it stands for. Never mind all that. The news is that um, the, with the Minerva follow up, of uh, TOI 257b, uh, it's not just a discovery. This is learning about the physical features mm. of uh, of uh, th- this planet. And as the lead author on the paper that's reported all this, uh, Dr. Brett Addison from University of Southern Queensland, basically uh, he said this is a significant discovery, not just for USQ and Queensland, but as an example of cool and unusual planet types. I think by cool there, he means interesting rather than low, yes, in, low yes. in temperature. Uh, TOI 257b is an example of what astronomers call sub-Saturns, and they're planets that are larger than Neptune and smaller than Saturn. And of course, there aren't any examples of that within our own solar system. Uh, uh, it's uh, as as um, Brett says, the universe is a quirky and diverse place mm. with broad classes of planets such as sub Saturns, super Earths, and mini Neptunes that we don't have here at home. Uh, warm sub Saturns like TOI 257b are rare among the currently known exoplanets, and that's true actually of of all these slightly odd things, the super Earths and the and the mini Neptunes. They, these are fairly rare categories. So. That the the two categories of planet that we find in our own solar system, which are uh, basically rock, small rocky planets and large gas planets, uh, they are really the commonest classes of planets that we find uh, out there in space. And things that don't quite fit into that, whilst they exist, are rare. And so I, uh, TOI 257b is one example of one of these rarities. So this is, you know, it's a great story. It's great news. The fact that we now know its density is less than that of water, that marks it out as being something pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, 
But there's more to come, I think, Andrew, because um, the authors of this paper suggest that their data shows strong evidence for a second planet in this system, TOI 257C. C. Yes, that's right. And they hope to confirm that uh, within this year. So uh, we will, um, you know, we'll hear more about uh, this, I'm, I'm sure, from University of Southern Queensland. As I said, it's a great Australian story. Um, the, uh, the, the two more comments uh, made by the authors of this paper, uh, the, the cloud tops of this planet are not um, particularly cool. They reach at least 1,300 degrees Celsius, uh, which is certainly more than the cloud tops of the Earth, so it's yeah. probably not that um, habitable a place. Um, and there's an in-joke here as well. It may be a Queenslander, but forget calling it Planet Maroon. The, the maroons, the colour of Queensland, is it? It's one of these silly sporting things, isn't yes, it? Yes, maroon is the official sporting colour of Queensland. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and sky blue is the uh, official sporting colour of New South Wales. Wales yeah. uh, so the, yes. forget, forget calling it Planet Maroon. It can only be officially named, uh, as can all bodies in the in the universe, by the International Astronomical Union. Probably most of the universe doesn't know about that, but um, certainly on Earth, uh, the International Astronomical Union is the place where things get named. Well, to be honest, if the Queenslanders were going to give a planet a name, it wouldn't be Maroon. It would be Wally or something like that, named after their most famous footballers. There you go. I'm pretty sure. Yes. Uh, now, there's another twist to this little story, is there not? Or am I getting it mixed up with another oh, story we get to do? <laughs> well, one of the one of my colleagues at USQ, uh, whose name is John T. Horner, a fantastic science communicator himself. I often hear him on the radio. Uh, his mother is one of our fans. Hey, <laughs> hello, Mrs. Jonty. <laughs> yes, uh, well, that's right. And she, but she lives. Uh, she lives on the Isle of Skye in oh, Western wow. Scotland, which is an absolutely enchanting place, uh, uh, especially when it's not raining. It, of course, the west of Scotland is traditionally a, a wet part of the world, mm. but Skye is lovely. And so, uh, to be honest, um, I think you would be well advised, Andrew, to be envious of uh, Jonty's mum on the Isle of Skye. Well, if she's given getting rain, put, I am envious. Yeah, given what you're putting up with every day. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, we are quite the opposite at the present mm, time. That's right. Well, that's wonderful. All right. Um, so maybe more to learn from the Minerva program in, uh, in Queensland. This is Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, um, I'm pleased to say that our numbers on YouTube are rising rapidly. And I, uh, I can see we're not we're not at a thousand yet, but I, I would envisage by next week we probably will have tipped the scale. Way, mm. uh, but we're we're moving up rapidly. So uh, if you would like to follow us uh, and subscribe on our YouTube channel, you can do so by just uh, doing a search for Space Nuts on YouTube. I think you'll also find a really old, terrible sci-fi movie named Space Nuts too. If you <laughs> search in the wrong place, but uh, youtubecom slash c slash Space Nuts, you'll find us and subscribe, and you can listen to everything, everything there. Um, including the, the movie, yeah, including the, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but not the um, bonus material. That's available via Patreon. We'll talk about that later. But uh, YouTube, we're we're ever ever more encroaching on the um, on the on the one thousand, which is fantastic. Now, um, uh, keeping the Australian flavour of this week's podcast uh, going, uh, Fred, there's a, a a place called Yarrabubba. It's an yeah. impact. Uh, site in Western Australia, and they now think it's the oldest impact site on Earth, which is rather fascinating. That's right. Uh, and in fact, you know, it's the, the dating that has been done on this on this impact site, and by that I mean dating of the rocks, not dating of people, uh, has, um, has a, a really staggering precision. I'm really impressed with the results that are coming from this. Uh, so um, uh, Yarrabubba, it's in Western Australia, uh, pretty well central in the state of Western Australia. I don't know, I would guess you know, several, uh, probably eight or 900 kilometres from Perth. Mm. Uh, probably not that far, actually, from the uh, Murchison station where the square kilometre array is being built. Uh, so in that neck of the woods. And, of course, that 
it is an extremely stable landscape geologically. It is um, quite ancient uh, it's landscape. A, that's and right. It's for a, those and, who are unaware um, that, that may live beyond our shores, Western Australia probably takes up around one third of the continental uh, mass of Australia. It is yep. a huge state, massive yep. state. And, and a lot of it is, you know, really stable and ancient pieces of Earth's crust. Mm. Um, we find, for example, in uh, further north than w w where we're talking about now, we find rocks that probably bear the evidence of the very first life that formed on Earth. These are these uh, microbial uh, mats called stromatolites. Um, but that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is, is a, a place where um, a, an asteroid... A, a, probably a moderately sized asteroid. I think we're talking about, you know, uh, several tens of kilometres here. This thing hit the Earth. It produced a 70-kilometre diameter crater on Earth. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, the evidence of that crater now is kind of buried, if I can put it that way. And that's partly because... Um, the Earth is a very dynamic planet. We've got weather erosion, and so structures like impact craters, unlike on the Moon, where there are many craters much older than this, um, that the impact craters on Earth get eroded down by weather processes. And actually, on most of the Earth's surface, they've disappeared because of, of plate tectonics. The, uh, the, the rocks which bear them have disappeared <laughs> underneath the nearest continental plate. Mm. Uh, as I said, though, this is very ancient rock here in Western Australia. And um, the way you tell that there is an impact crater there is basically by studying the geology. Um, you can tell that there are slight gravitational uh, anomalies um, and that, uh, you know, you can look for um, the kind of crystals that get produced by high temperature impact uh, around the boundary of, the, of what would have been the crater before it was eroded away. So the evidence that there was an impact here is very strong. But what's new and the reason why you and I are speaking about this story now uh, is the dating of this crater. And uh, that is basically uh, results or it's research that has come from studies of the crystals that are within the rocks uh, that, that were impacted by whatever it is that, that hit them. Uh, things uh, like zircon crystals, uh, which uh, can be basically can be um, used as 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 clocks to, to work out when an impact or when uh, a, a, there was a shock passed through them. Uh, and these zircon crystals have allowed the dating of the Yarrabubba crater to within an accuracy. I did look this up, actually, in the uh, original paper, but I don't have it in front of me. But I think it's five. The accuracy is five million years. Now, that sounds like a lot, um, but... Uh, the date is 2.229 billion years ago. Wow. Uh, so you're looking at an uncertainty of the, you know, of five in the last number of that. Um, 2.229 billion years uh, with very high precision. Why is that, um, you know, why is it a record breaker? Because the, 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 uh, what used to be the earliest known asteroid strike, which is in South Africa, actually, uh, that was actually 200 million years later than this. Uh, so, um, so you know, around about two two billion years ago. So that uh, pushes back the uh, the record for the earliest known impact structure on Earth back to 2.29. Uh, 2.229 billion years, which is round about half the age of the Earth. The Earth mm. is about 4.6. So what would billion, Earth have so. been like 2.2 well, billion years ago? that's where it gets even more interesting ah. because um, the, the Earth has gone through a number of periods. I think there are thought to be about five of them when it was basically a snowball. It was covered in ice. Okay. Uh, the, the atmospherics were such that the all water on the surface was frozen uh, and the, the planet was basically uh, covered. It was covered in ice. It's sometimes called snowball Earth because of that, as I just said. Um, but um, that, that um, I think it was the, well, one of those icy periods came to an end 
around about 2.229 billion years ago. Oh. And so the bow that the authors of this paper are drawing, uh, and I think they're based, uh, I think the principal author is based at NASA Johnson, uh, the Johnson Space Center in Houston. Um, so uh, the, the, the bow that they're drawing is that perhaps this impact lofted enough uh, water vapor into the atmosphere and maybe carbon dioxide as well uh, to change the climate. And, and in other words, to bring the icy period to an end, this period of mass glaciation. Uh, so um, there are people who are saying that's too long a, bro a bow to draw, uh, but uh, it does look as though that's a reasonably interesting, at least, explanation for that, that, uh, that perhaps uh, whatever clouted the Earth at that at time was basically the uh, the thing that caused the earth to switch climate wow so uh, some are saying that's an absolute some are saying that's a partial reason some are saying nah <laughs> something else did it well yeah that's right um there's uh, some um s yeah some uh scientists uh are actually fairly you know a bit skeptical about that mm. um the uh, Basically, uh, there, there, there is, um, you know, there, there is some criticism of the modelling being uh, ske speculative. One of the criticisms is that if you throw up a lot of uh, water vapour or, or um, you know, or carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, the climatic effect doesn't last for all that long. Uh, and so, you know, is that enough to, to end this global glaciation phenomenon? Uh, the question is, that's a question that we don't have have an answer to. But uh, I think all the people who are critical still think it's, uh, it's quite neat research, and especially this dating of the crater with such high precision. Yes, indeed. And uh, unfortunately, it's a very isolated place and very hard to get to, I would imagine. Uh, or even if it's easy to get to, it's a heck of a long trip. It's a long way, that's yeah. right. So uh, if you want to go and look at it, um, I think photographs are probably the best way to go. It just it just looks like the typical arid interior of Australia, really. Actually, yes. it looks, looks a lot like Dubbo is looking at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, well, yes, I suppose that's true. It's certainly very brown. Indeed. Um, okay, um, so uh, we may learn more as time goes on. These studies are ongoing, a lot of the things we talk about, and uh, occasionally we can revisit them when more information comes to light. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Space Nuts with Professor Fred Watson and Andrew Dunkley, of course. Okay, we checked all four systems and team with a go. Space Nuts. Now, once again, uh, reminding you that you can support the Space Nuts podcast by becoming a patron, and you can do that at our Patreon website, patreon.com slash space nuts. Uh, you can spend uh, $3 a month, 5 10 whatever you like. Some people have chosen to spend more, and that is wonderful. Thank you. Uh, it is not mandatory, but as a patron, we are offering bonus material every week, which is uh, building up rather nicely. We're also offering you an early access edition of Space Nuts commercial free. So uh, that is what's on offer for patrons. Uh, Patreon.com slash Space Nuts if you'd like to check it out. If it's not for you, that's fine. But the option is there. Now, Fred, uh, we normally uh, answer some questions at this time, but uh, this week we, we want to talk about a uh, rather uh, wonderful uh, award that has been given to an Australian astronomer. And uh, this is the first time in many, many years that such a, an award has been offered to an Australian. It's the James Craig Watson Award. Um, nothing to do with me. Uh, it was uh, named after um, a, an American Canadian astronomer and has been presented every two years since 1887 uh, by, um, I think it's the, uh, it's actually, the, um, is it the, um, Yes, the National Academy of Science in the USA. So the James Craig Watson Medal uh, is something that recognises scientists of very high distinction. Uh, and as I said, US National Academy of Science. Uh, it hasn't ever been presented 
to an Australian. And in fact, it hasn't ever been presented to somebody in the Southern Hemisphere. So this is the first time uh, it's gone to uh, somebody in our country. And its recipient is very, very worthy of the honour. Uh, the recipient is Professor Lisa Cooley, who is, uh, you know, a, a job title is quite, quite extensive. It takes a while to read. It's a couple She's of pages. A professor and, uh, and Australian Research Council Laureate Fellow at the Australian National University. That's in Canberra, of course. Uh, but she's also a director of um, something called the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence in All Sky Astrophysics in Three Dimensions. It's usually known as Astro 3D. I've had a fair bit to do with Astro 3D on and off over the years that it has uh, existed, uh, but Lisa directs it. And what this is all about, so uh, All Sky Astrophysics in 3D, of course, is basically looking at the whole sky, but with the additional dimension of distance in there. Uh, and that doesn't just mean the distance is two objects, it means galaxies as well. Mm. Um, so what she's done, uh, and, and Lisa has a whole, uh, you know, track record of, of awards and uh, fellowships, um, but she is uh, an established world leader uh, in the theoretical modelling and observation of star-forming and active galaxies. Uh, her seminal contributions, and I'm reading now from the uh, press release, include understanding the gas physics in such galaxies, understanding galaxies containing actively accreting supermassive black holes. That means black holes feeding on the stuff around them, uh, as you know, of course, Andrew, and tracing the star formation and oxygen history of galaxies over the past 12 billion years. So it's, you know, it's big picture stuff. It is. And of course, that feeds directly into our understanding of the way the universe has evolved, the way uh, the way our uh, our own um, our own galaxy has evolved. So she's done a lot uh, in modelling uh, how these things take place. Uh, the theoretical modelling, uh, as as I mentioned a minute ago, that's basically been what she's done, and those models fit extraordinarily well to what we observe. Uh, in the universe. So it's uh, great stuff. And actually, um, she, you know, the, the, almost single handedly in some ways, she's she's transformed uh, the field. Uh, one of the other uh, of Lisa's accolades uh, is that she was one of the astronomy magazine's top 10 rising stars in 2009. And she appeared on national documentaries for the Discovery Channel and the National Geographic Channel. So this is a person who's uh, whose trajectory has been very steeply upwards, and I'm really not surprised that she has received this medal. But it is delightful that she, you know, becomes the first um, person in our hemisphere to get it, especially because one of her passions, of course, is you know uh, women in STEM and similar educational activities. It's bringing uh, the kind of science that we do to as broad and as a, as diverse. Uh, a, 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 an audience as possible and to encourage people from all backgrounds uh, uh, and all ranges of diversity uh, to come in and become scientists themselves. So she's really an inspiring uh, figure in, uh, in Australian astronomy. Now, question without notice, it's the James Craig Watson Award. Do you know much about James Craig Watson? Um, only that he has a name very similar to mine. Uh, I have a son called James Watson. Oh, um, yes, you I, do. Yes, I do. I should have checked up on that uh, because I don't actually know what uh, James Craig Watson uh, did. Uh, he, as, as I mentioned, he's an American-Canadian astronomer to uh, basically to uh, set up a bequest of an award. You need to be fairly well healed. A lot well, of that's, that's why I, I brought it up because I thought, yeah. you know, th th this is an award that comes with, um, you know, a couple of dollars attached to it, yeah. uh, $7.50. And it... Um, yeah, it, Are those US dollars or Australian dollars? <laughs> Probably yeah. US dollars. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I wondered where he amassed his fortune. So 
Um, I will try and check up on that, Andrew. Yeah, but uh, yeah, uh, obviously a, 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 a very successful man in his time. And we're talking like, you know, um, middle of the 1800s, basically, when he was around doing his thing. Uh, and um, yeah, highly successful. So uh, yeah, what a okay. great award and what great success for her. So I've now followed up on your question. <laughs> that's an answer. It. That's, that's an old radio trick called padding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well done. Let me um, because the press release actually has a note about the James Craig Watson Medal, which is very nice. Handy. It is handy. Um, the James Craig Watson Medal is presented every two years for outstanding contributions to the science of astronomy and carries with it a gold-plated bronze medal, Ooh. a $25,000 prize, never mind this this $7.50, Andrew, mm. and $50,000 to support the recipient's research. Uh, the Watson Medal was established by uh, NAS member um, and prolific Canadian-American astronomer James Craig Watson. Watson is credited with discovering 22 asteroids in his lifetime. He published many articles and wrote a popular treatise on comets in 1861 and theoretically in uh, theoretical astronomy in 1868. Isn't that wonderful? So, yeah, a notable, a notable person, and what a great name! I do like that that surname he's got there. Yeah, funny that. Yeah. <laughs> mm. All right, uh, that is wonderful news. Uh, we'll get back to questions next week. We just thought we needed to um, uh, recognise such a great achievement from uh, someone who's obviously very, very passionate, like you, Fred, but uh, has um, has really uh, made some inroads into some of those areas, those those yeah. massive areas of astronomy that we so often talk about. So uh, that's right. What a, exactly. what a, what a great effort. Um, and that'll wrap us up for another week. Uh, I will remind people, however, that you can visit the Space Nuts shop uh, at our website, bytes.com slash space nuts, and pick yourself up a, uh, a T-shirt or maybe a book. There's a couple of nice books there by one Professor Fred Watson uh, and some other joker. But, uh, yeah, have a look. And um, if, uh, There's one about golf there, isn't there? Yeah, uh, Five Irons Don't Float was one of my <laughs> experimental books. I, I wrote this um, tongue-in-cheek sports psychology book just for fun. <laughs> and it took me about an hour and a half to write it. Um, <laughs> but it, but it, it, it's based on um, my gathering of knowledge through um, stories I've done on sports psychology psychology and a lot of books I've read on sports psychology, particularly focusing on golf and how to think and how not to lose your mud playing the game. Mm. Um, and I, I thought, well, you know, I know this has been done before, but I'll, I'll write a rather tongue-in-cheek, um, somewhat bawdy version of a sports psychology <laughs> book and, and really take it down to the bottom of the barrel. And... <laughs> And it worked. Right, it's go. only it's only about fifty pages, but um, it's aimed at golfers who basically lose their tempers, <laughs> and, and how okay. not to. Um, sadly, as the author, it didn't work for me, but it'll work for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just fun. It was an experiment to see how I go publishing an ebook, and um, yeah, um, I just wanted to do that and see if the process was worth pursuing. And uh, yeah, it turned out all right. Um, and and the the cover is uh, my five iron sitting at the bottom of a lake. Right. Yeah. Which is what the planet Saturn wouldn't do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> or planet TOI257B. That's the one, yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Fred. As always, it's been a great pleasure and lots of fun. Yeah, no, no worries, Andrew, and we'll speak again soon. We will indeed. Catch you next yeah. week. And from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks again. Uh, if uh, you're a patron, we've got some bonus material coming up for you very soon on our Patreon account. Otherwise, we'll catch up with you next week on another edition of Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also so stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.